Uh, we are the Church of Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor David Greenwich. We're the Tiger Covenant Church, and we're here for one purpose, to give God the glory, to give Him the honor, and to be a blessing to the community, to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be a fellowship that disciples and cares about one another, and has ministries of mercy, compassion, and justice. And we're talking this morning about finishing the work. The last sermon, we're going to finish the sermon series, and the title of the sermon is Finish the Work. So we're coming out of the book of Ezra, chapter 6. And the way we do it here is we read the word of God together as a congregation. Uh, I'll read it, and then I'll say the word of the Lord, and then together, in a hearty voice, we say the thanks be to God. So we're going to look at chapter 6 of Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 13. Shall we stand for the reading of God's word? Ezra 6, 13. Then because of the decree, King Darius had sent Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar, Ozenai, and their associates carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, a descendant of Edom. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Adarexus, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated. Everybody say celebrated. The dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred male lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem according to what was written in the book of Moses. The word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we ask that you bless your word to our hearts, that we would receive it and live by it and be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said, Amen. 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 So we started out in the book of Ezra, chapter 1, and we were looking at some key chapters in this book, and it was a wonderful, wonderful book because it started out with chapter 1. And chapter 1 talked about the fact that we needed to hear the word of the Lord. So just go back and I'll just review in about two minutes the first sermon. Just so we'll have some context. Chapter 1 of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord, spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put in writing, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord of God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem. So it says, the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. So sermon number one was called the word of the Lord. And I talked to you about three things. That God's word comes from his anointed servant, number one. God to, uh, point number two, the word of God will be fulfilled when spoken. Jeremiah spoke it and it came to pass. The children of Israel were taken into bondage by a foreign nation. And I love this part of the sermon when I do kind of call and response, when I allow you to speak back at me. It's so wonderful. Uh, so speak back at me right now. Why did God allow the nation of Israel to be taken in the bondage? Anybody? Amen. Someone said it, that three-letter word. Sin was in the camp. People were turning their backs on God. People were doing wrong things. So he allowed a foreign nation to take over. And they were in exile, taken over by the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and then the Persians in different intervals of time, and they were taken over 
because of sin, and they were in exile for 70 years. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, and he said they eventually would be set free. So God's word came through Jeremiah that they would be taken over, and it happened. So point number two is that the word of the Lord will be fulfilled when spoken. If it's God's word, oh, it's going to happen. God's coming back one day. Jesus is coming back on the planet Earth. It's God's word. It will happen. God has declared that everybody here in this house will be healed one day eventually. It's going to happen. God declares that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should uh, come to repentance. And there's going to be a great harvest of souls in the last day before Jesus comes back. It's going to happen. Say amen. When God's word is spoken, when you get the word of the Lord and you're reading God's word or a prophet of God comes to you and confirms what's in the book, you receive that word. And you receive it and you believe it because it's going to happen. I get excited that the word of the Lord will be fulfilled. And then finally, the word of God is a word of hope. There are a lot of people that are doing doom and gloom. But the truth of the matter is, the word of God is a word of hope. And God wants you and I to have hope in tomorrow. Don't be dismayed and depressed about everything that's going on in the news and all the shootings in California. While it's dismal, while it's sad, while it's upsetting even sometimes, the word of God is the word of hope. We can lift up our heads and not hang them down low. We can lift up our eyes and look to the hills from whence cometh our help because God is coming on the scene. He's going to break through the madness, break through your sadness, break through your problem, and he's going to lift you up and give you hope and cause you to rebuild. Let the church say amen. And then sermon number two is taken from Ezra chapter three. Turn to Ezra chapter three. And we call it the work of the church. The work of the church, which is to rebuild. Do you realize that you and I are called to rebuild the broken down institutions of society? We're called to rebuild broken lives. All around us is broken down, broken down. It's all around us. There are ghettos of despair all around us. There are slums that are despicable that you and I need to take a stand against the powers of darkness and evil. And we need to go volunteer. Our young people went down to Sacramento last summer and they volunteered with a covenant church down in Sacramento. And they went to the parts of Sacramento that weren't too lovely. And we covered them with prayer. And we sent some good youth leaders with them. And they went and served in those neighborhoods. And they were a blessing. Let the young people say amen. amen. Those of you that went, you know what I'm talking about. And you and I are called to do the same thing. We're called to go into the unlovely, unhealthy places of society and lift up a word of hope. And that word of hope is Jesus Christ. Let the church say amen. amen. So the work of the church, point number one, is that people were unified. The focus when they started rebuilding, the person they rebuilt was the altar because the altar signifies what? Talk to me again. What does the altar signify? Worship, and someone said in the back, getting right with God. The first thing they rebuilt was not the sidewalks. The first thing they put up wasn't even a foundation, wasn't the roof. The first thing they put up was an altar, which was in front of where the church of the temple would be built, because the altar was where the people of God could get right with God and repent of their sins. Everybody say amen to that. And then the third thing was, is that the rebuilding of God's temple and them starting to rebuild caused the people to be afraid. And I said, sometimes fear will make you get busy. When you get afraid, you start calling on the name of the Lord. When you get afraid, even though fear is not of God, you get you to call it on the name of the Lord. And so the people were afraid, but they got busy and turned their fear into positive action. Sermon number two. And then sermon number three was taken from Ezra chapter three and verse 11. And it says that they praised God after the foundations were built up. And so the sermon was to praise the Lord God Almighty. The people of God provided resources for the rebuilding of the temple, point number one. Now point number two, there was a plan in the rebuilding process. They were led by the priests and the leaders on how to build the temple of God because they had gotten the word of the God, the word of the Lord from Moses, and there was a specific way they had to build the temple, and there was a plan in the process. And then finally, the, pray, the, the completing of the foundation emanated with praises of God. And I have a special sermon that I'm working on, on praise and the praise and the life of the believer that when you and I praise God, oh, something wonderful happens. Let the church say amen for our worship team that led us in praise this morning. Adrian, y'all did a good job. Give me a hand clap this morning. When everything else looks really dreary, when you feel like you are being overcome and oppressed by the enemy, when you 
feel like there's an evil presence in your room, or when you just flat out don't feel like it at all, start praising God. Praise is the weapon of the life of every true believer that enables us to move above our immediate circumstances into the heavens where God is and victory is ours. Because the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. And when you and I open up our mouths like we did this morning and praise God, he's ready and only willing to answer your prayer. So praise the Lord. And then finally, the sermon last week talked about opposition from the enemy. We came out of Ezra chapter 4. And when you and I do a work for God, the enemy doesn't like it. Young people, I don't know if you remember the song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down there in my heart. Well, then when I was younger, we used to sing that song, the vacation Bible here. And then we had a little verse that went like this. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tag. Ouch! <laughs> so we used to sing that song. And you and I need to know that the opposition of the enemy is going to come. And the devil is going to try and mess with you. And young people, when you praise the Lord, you don't have to worry about it. Because the devil has to even sit on a tag and say, ouch! Because you are praising God and you're pushing him out. When Jesus was in the wilderness, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus in the wilderness. He gave him the word of God, and the devil had to flee. And then this morning, we're talking about finishing the work. We receive opposition from the enemy. There's a cost in following God, and we're talking about finishing the work. And so if you have your outlines, pull it out right now. And write in consistency and obedience in doing God's work will cause a blessing, right, a blessing to come your way. Right, in consistency and obedience in doing God's work will cause a blessing to come your way. So let's track the history of what happened as they started building. So the people of God started building. They got the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Cyrus. Cyrus gave permission for the children of Israel to go back. That was first chapter 1 of Ezra. They started building. And remember, Cyrus gave the people favor. So young people, when they went back to their homeland to build, God gave them resources to build. God told the people that were their neighbors to give them resources, give them silver and gold, and whatever other cost they needed with rebuilding. How many, uh, how many, how many contractors or or cabinetry or carpenter or people, any one of those kind of experiences in the house region. All right, so I'm talking to carpenters this morning. When you go to rebuild, let's say a structure like this church, just talk to me, you carpenters. What kind of materials do you need? Wood. Wood? What else? Nails. Nails? Nails. What else? Nails. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Tools? Concrete? Concrete? A plan. A, a plan. <laughs> Resource. 
I went to a pastor's meeting this week. On Thursday, we were gathered, and this one brother had laid it on his heart to go to Africa. I forgot what country this is in Virginia. And I said, man, Africa's getting a lot of attention. And he had it in his heart that he wanted to do a campaign, and he not only wanted to go, but he wanted to interact with the people, and not just do a revival, not just preach the gospel, but he wanted to give them resources. And he needed $6,000 by the end of last week, because I, I went to this pastor's meeting twice. I go back last week, and it was crazy God. I got to the meeting just a few minutes after the hour, and it was crazy God. Because this brother had gotten $6,000 that he needs to go to Africa, and he came to the same day. What's the church say? When you put it in your heart to do something for God, God will bless you. And our outline this morning says consistency. Hallelujah. Consistency and being obedient and doing God's work will be a big blessing to you. You're going to do God's work. You're going to get the resources to do God's work. And in so doing, you are going to be blessed. God will meet all your needs. God will give you spillover blessings so that not only your needs will be met, but there will be other needs that will be met around you so that you can be a blessing to some other person. Look at uh, Ezra chapter 6 and verse 14. So the elders of the Jews continued to build, and what does it say? And prosper. Isn't that amazing? They built the temple of God and they prospered. Notice it didn't say they took a trip to the Oregon coast and prospered. Notice it didn't say, I went to uh, your favorite leisurely activity and prospered. Notice in the Bible, it never talks about the prospering coming when you and I are doing the occasional things in life. And those occasional things in life are not bad. We need to do those things. We need to take vacations. We need to take time out. We need to take time to recuperate and regenerate. But you can't take time to take time out and make time out be the priority of what you do all your life. You got to be doing God's work and lining up with His priorities, and then a vacation is to your body. But as you build, you will prosper. So where's where's so where's where's the attention that I'm getting now from those of you that have need in their finances? And our sister Shaw is going to be covering this. When you and I will do God's work, God will meet your needs. Let the church say Amen. amen. If you want a blessing, if you want a breakthrough in your finances, start lining yourself up with the priorities of God. You know, when Trish and I met when we were corporate, uh, when we were uh, courting, we both were on our trajectory. I've only been a pastor here at the church for eight years. Most of my experience has been in the corporate world. I worked as an executive in an insurance company, but I didn't start as an executive. I started as a training position out of college. And so when I married Trish, she was starting in her career. And I wanted to marry somebody who had the same passion for God that I had. And it was interesting to see what the trajectory of our careers it started doing just like this. Because we both taught Sunday school in the church together. We both taught Sunday school classes in our church up in Seattle. We both had a love for people in the community and help people. We, there were many occasions where we'd be in downtown Seattle and we'd be going to a restaurant and a guy who was homeless would come up to us and say, we don't have any money and we had a policy of not giving out money because most of the time, a lot of the people that receive money are using it for bad purposes. So instead, we're we'll offering by a meal. And there were several cases where Trish and I be, had the kids in tow. We had three boys at this point. Kids in tow. We're going into the restaurant. Someone would come up and ask us for money. And we would say, no, we don't give you money, but you can eat a meal with us. And Trish and I were committed to people who were homeless and people who had need. And we invite them to eat meals with us many a time. And many a time I've done that over the, over the years, helping people out and giving them resources. People that you don't want to turn your backs on because God has called you and I to be a caring agent of his love to everybody, none excluded. Everybody say amen to that? Amen. Do you know what happened to our careers? We served in the church. 
We raised our kid. I have one. I'm so proud. My nephew, Ignatius, and his wife, Carmen, and Ignatius raised their hand. And she and I, and Carmen and Trish, were having a meal last night. We were talking about how we have all these activities that we have to do for our kids when they're young. And we have to take them to the soccer game, take them to the baseball game, take them to the school activity. And we had kids in tow. We also sang in the church choir. And we also served in the community. And we did it joyfully. And when I decided that Trish and I, when I decided to marry Trish, and I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. And I was so happy that one of the things that I looked at was that a person who could partner with me and a person who had the same love for God and for people. And so we were a team together and served the Lord. Guess what happened with our personal jobs? Remember that trajectory? How many promotions? Stand up, Trish. <laughs> no, stand up. Put me on the spot. Because you just said it yesterday. How many promotions did you get in your job? She started out in the hotel and entertainment industry. This is testimony time. I thought the same. Twelve. Twelve? I went from a purchasing clerk to the um, um, manager of the procurement department for Western Hotels. Get ready, right here, right? Uh, promotions. I got five promotions in about a six year period of time. And some of those promotions that I got, saints of God, I looked at some of those jobs I was applying for and I'm going, wow, this is a lot of responsibility. And I was good, I was qualified, I had the skills, but you know, you still have some doubt whether you could do a job or not. But all I can tell you is that the blessing of the Lord was on Trish and I's life because we were faithful in doing God's priority and God blessed us immensely. And God is no respecter of persons. I'm kind of pausing on this point because as you are being consistent and faithful and burning, thank you for the testimony you brought up this morning because we're seeing that in this church and I'm already hearing major and marvelous stories about you being blessed. Because you're being consistent and faithful in doing God's work. And God's going to bless you. He's going to bless you in your job. He's going to bless you in your educational pursuits. He's going to bless you in your relationships. He's going to bless you in your, in your dealings in the business world and your dealings with people in general. And some of the obstacles and hassles and problems that people have, he's going to make it a smooth path for you because you put God first. Do you know what happened to the prophet Jeremiah? I think I mentioned this. I mentioned this about a month ago. The prophet Jeremiah had prophesied that the nation would be taken over by a foreign nation. They would be conquered, and they were. In the midst of him being conquered, the nation being conquered, God blessed the prophet Jeremiah, even though they put him in jail. Because what happened was they put him in jail. Because he spoke all these bad news. The king didn't want to hear the message of Jeremiah. And even though he was in jail, Jeremiah got a blessing. He was able to buy a piece of land, even though he was in jail. And after the nation got liberated, that boy had that land and prospered because God was with the man of God. He'll be with the man or the woman of God who we're faithful in doing his will, and he will go against enormous, enormous forces of ab ab uh, that are adversarial to you to enable you to be an overcomer. If you have your pen, pick it up again. Point number two, rather than working and listening to the Word of God is a good formula for success. Working and listening to the Word of God is a good formula for success. Look at verse 14. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching, here it is, the Word of God, the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the descendant of Edo, they finished the building, the temple according to the command to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus. So when the word of God is preached, and you hear the word of God, and you are actively taking what you hear, and then put it in practice, oh my goodness. You can't help but be a success. See, many people are in the church and they're just attending. Oh, it doesn't apply. Most of you get tired of coming to church. I'm serious. You guys are busy doing God's work. You know, I did a little catalog this week. 
Uh, Sister Bernie went out because she'd get ready for the food. But I, I did a little cam on it this week. And I just started thinking about all the things that are going on in this church. And it's in keeping with Sister Bernie got. I noticed that we do food pantry ministry. We do food pantry ministry on Mondays and Tuesdays. And then we help hundreds of people with food. I noticed this week that some of the members went to pick up some cabinets that were donated to the church. I noticed this week that Women of Purpose I have women in this church that are praying with other members of our church, and they are praying. And then a homeless person came into our midst and needed a place to stay and administered God's grace to this person and gave them a Bible. I just, I just started to notice some all the things that were going on. I noticed that people came, just all volunteers, people came and cleaned up the building several times during the week. Just came, they were calling me, knocking on the door, Pastor, I need to come in, I want, I want to clean the church. I know that people came in and were working in the church office and providing administrative support in our church office, getting our bulletin done, getting our finances done. I noticed that on Tuesday night that there was a covering of prayer support. And that the people in the prayer meeting were praying for all of us here right now. They prayed for the service on Sunday. They prayed for other uh, churches of God around the world. They prayed for one another. Some shared personal needs that they were having. And we laid hands on people and prayed. And the prayer of this church is supporting this ministry, supporting you. And many of you are coming in and out of that prayer meeting. Some of you even came to all night prayer meeting that we had about a month ago, led by Women of Purpose and this church. And God is doing marvelous things because we as the people of God are coming together. I got calls this week from other members that they had reached out to a member who was lonely and was feeling down. And this member encouraged another member and was asking me to pray. I noticed that we're meeting in small groups of men, small groups of women, and we're having Bible study and we're praying and we're meeting the needs of one another and we're meeting the needs of the community. We are working and we are listening to the word of God. This is a good formula for success. We are poised as a church and we're getting ready to break through into some new ministries, into some powerful works of God, into some powerful times where we are going to see God do some amazing, amazing things. When I was down in, in California and I went to this pastor's conference, the Lord blessed me to go and you, the church, sent me down there. I got so excited because we are going to, as a church, are going to be focusing on some priorities for 2012. In 2012, we are going to initiate the biblical, the biblical mandate of every good church, which is Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples. We're going to teach people the word of God. We're going to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to see them get saved. And then we're going to allow them the experience to grow in their walk with God. And so the director of evangelism for the covenant just wrote this booklet. And our denomination is so key and so right on with the priorities of God that they're going to give one of these booklets to every member in our church. And all of our churches, Carmen, you're going to get it up too. Carmen goes to, and the nation go to Covenant Church of Seattle. They're going to get one of these books, if your pastor orders it, by the way, so it's on order. But he's going to order it. He's already talked about it. And every member is going to get this, and they're providing us at no charge. The only thing we have to pay is shipping. And so what we're going to do is, I had already determined before I went on this trip, just to show y'all how the Spirit of Faith works, that I was going to do a class on evangelism on Sunday mornings at hour before church. And I was going to do that class for 12 weeks, so all of you invited. And we're going to be starting this in about another month. I'll give you more dates about when it's going to start. And I'm going to do a four-sermon series on Sunday morning on how to share your faith. And this book has the four principles, and I've read it, and it already lines up with the things that God has been laying on my heart, because God laid on John Teeter, he's the writer of this book, but laid it on his heart, he laid it on my heart, and we're all saying the same thing, and the first thing is prayer. And so we're going to be talking about how you and I can have skills to share our faith with others in practical ways. And there's going to be a book that I'll be passing out to each and every one of you. Let the church say amen. So we're going to learn how to share our faith. We're going to, we're going to dissect it 
more on Sunday mornings now before church. And then all during the year, we're going to provide the opportunities for us to share our faith and we can invite people to. And we are getting out on the move for God to be a blessing to the world. Let the church say amen. Amen. Point number three, write it in your outline. The people of God celebrated the completed work of rebuilding God's house. That's why we have our times of eating food. That's why we have our times of having our meals together. And we have our times of rejoicing. We have our times of praising God. And we lift up our hands and we get excited. Look at verse, uh, verse 16 in Ezra chapter 6. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bills and they so forth and all the other animals that they offered. Why was it so important for them to celebrate this building of the temple? Why was it so important that the people of God had to start with the altar first and then they had to build the temple? Because they had to come back to their own land. Remember I mentioned it in one of the sermons? You would think that they would have established their priorities for them to build their own houses. Because the foreign nation had actually conquered them, like the whole land, and it was like a tornado came through, and all their houses were burned down. But they chose to build God's house first. Well, here's one reason. Turn in, turn in your Bibles to have several scriptures here, but turn in your Bible to 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 7. And this was the first temple that God laid it on the heart of his servant to build the first temple. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And here it is. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest did not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. Now what's the glory? The presence of the Lord. When the glory of the Lord comes into the house of God, you and I are healed. We start thinking right. We start doing right. We start caring about one another right. We start walking in righteousness and in holiness. We want the glory of the Lord to show up in this place. And you and I experienced that this morning because when we raised our hands and when Virginia and Elder Chuck prayed for you, we were experiencing the glory of the Lord. You're going to have a good week. Oh, yeah. You came into the house of God with a little sickness or a little uneasiness in your body. You're being healed. We're speaking in Jesus' name. You're leaving this building energized to go out and be blessed. In class this morning, one of our brothers that was in class said the Lord gave him a conversation that he had with a stranger this week. And he was able to tell him about Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm desiring to see, that God is giving us those divine appointments all week long when we can be kind to people, people that are sick are being taken care of. We're going out and ministering God's grace to people. We're speaking the word of God to young people, to other young people, and they are being healed. And you guys are walking in truth, and you're saying no to the temptations of the enemy. And adults, you're saying no to the temptations of the enemy. And instead, we're speaking righteousness, and we're speaking help. And as a result, we're going to celebrate the presence of the Lord. We're going to celebrate the presence of the Lord as we rebuild the broken down institutions in society. We're going to celebrate what God is doing as we become sensitized to the priorities of God. And we do the great commission. And we do the great commandment. And we not worry about all the other things that we can get caught up with in church life. You know church is like an institution. And you know church is like this big complicated ordeal that we made so complicated. And Jesus made it very clear that he wants us to go out and be a disciple of souls and to make people and to lead people into the kingdom of God. And when we function and when we live on that level, we're moving in the things of God and great things are happening. So this year, buckle your seatbelts. We are taking off. This year, put aside all the encumbrances and things that are stopping you. Young people, we are going in the name of the Lord. Carmen, you don't know this, but you're you 
thank you for coming to church to help these young people when we do our vacation Bible camp this summer. And we, last year, reached about 40 kids a night. And I talked to our leader, Teacher Art, and he said, let's double the number. We're going to reach 80 kids all week long for vacation Bible camp. And they're coming up to help you do vacation Bible camp. Let's give the Lord a hand. So the next time you hear a bad report on the TV, the next time you hear a bad statement by the press, CNN, or any other news uh, outlet, I want you to say that Jesus is Lord. And in my neck of the woods, I reject what the enemy is doing, and I replace it with the light of the gospel, and I'm going to let his love permeate my home, my school that I work at, my job that I work at, and we are going to slowly but surely take territory for the enemy. We are not going to be the ones anymore that they're going to sit by and hear the newscast and go, oh my God, what is this society going to? i got to go pop another five in. But you instead are going to pick up the word of God and you're going to drink the word of God and get filled with the Holy Ghost and even get slain in the spirit and be baptized in the Holy Ghost because you are going to be a new man and a new creature that's going to be doing the things of God and you're not reading and buying the enemy's line, but you're reading and adhering to and imparting the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and you're walking in a whole different direction and you are not going to be held down Yeah.